wherever you are joining us. Greetings and welcome. I'm the regional manager for Globe Essex Western Africa Center here in Accra, Ghana. It is my singular honor to welcome us all, joining us from different parts of the world. The lead presenter today in the person of Professor Alfred Otinyebwa, CSOs, NGOs, government agencies, some authorities from the affected communities we'll be discussing around today, members of the higher education institutional community, organization representatives here, Global Ethics Associates joining us from countries outside Ghana. I'm aware we have some joining us from India and Pakistan, the media and all distinguished guests joining us today. You're welcome. For many of us joining us, this may well be your first engagement with Global Ethics. Whilst for others, you have worked with us through the years and you were even with us last month when we held our webinar on digital wellbeing, organized with the Cybersecurity Authority, speakers from Ghana, and also speakers from the cyberlaw.net university in India. So we're introducing Global Ethics non-governmental organization and public engagements. We are registered in Geneva, Switzerland as an independent not-for-profit foundation with an international board, affiliated centers across the globe, and a global network of teachers, students, professionals, and partner institutions. In the course of our interactions today, you will get to know a lot more about who we are, what we do, and especially our free online resources and how we can mutually partner in the vision of embedding ethics for transformational societies. Before we go on with the business for today, please allow me to share with you a quick rundown of our agenda for today. We will begin with brief greetings from two key personalities, which I have the pleasure of welcoming here today. We will be welcoming the Dean of the Global Ethics Academy in the person of Professor Amele Ekwe, and also the National Contact for Global Ethics in Ghana in the person of Reverend Dr. Emmanuel Ansa. He is convener for Kingdom Equip Network, which is also the host center for the Global Ethics Western Africa Center here in Accra. I will go on to introduce our moderator, who is the immediate past executive secretary to the Water Commission in Ghana. And then she will take over and introduce our speaker for today and guide us through the discussion, discussion sessions, pardon me, before we go ahead and then we'll get to know more of, of Global Ethics, as I mentioned earlier. Then we'll invite some brief remarks from some key stakeholders who have joined us today. And then the reactor will, will give us also his remarks, and then we'll bring some announcements. Please don't go away whilst we get into the wrap-up session of, of today's meeting, because I'll be sharing with you some useful links around the ethics of sustainability and environmental justice that we have available on our online website, which is free to us. After that, then we can go ahead and close our engagements and interactions here today. Quickly, before we go on again, allow me to share some few housekeeping um, for effectiveness in our engagement. This meeting is being recorded, as you can see, and hereafter, it will be uploaded and shared with you for you to access on the Global Ethics YouTube space. This is a Zoom meeting. So as such, I invite us all to keep an eye on our microphones, especially, and to keep them off at all times, unless we need to speak. Please use the chat box on your screens to introduce yourselves, including your name, your institution, and what part of the world you are joining us from. This will be seen by everyone. Also, we'll be sharing with you the relevant links I already mentioned and any other communication in the chat box. You can raise your hands and allow the moderator to invite you to bring your questions and your comments. We will try and make every effort to address the questions and to collect your comments. But you also have another opportunity when we share the feedback forms with you to give us all your comments from our discussions today and as you would want us to work together to implement. Allow me now and join me as I welcome Dr. Emily Ekwe, the Academic Dean for Global Ethics Academy situated in Switzerland. She is a Protestant theologian and professor of ethics originating from Togo. She specializes in ethics, ecumenics, 
and intercultural theology. She previously served the World Council of Churches for 12 years as professor of ethics at the Ecumenical Institute Bose and as program executive for ecumenical theological education. This happened between 20, 2007 and 2019. Professor Emily Ekwe joined Globe Ethics in 2019, and she currently holds the position of academic dean and also heads the academic unit of Globe Ethics, which includes our online library, publications and research, and the library units. Will you all join me with a virtual round of applause? I welcome Dr. Emily Ekwe and Reverend Dr. Ansa to give us brief greetings in succession. Shall we welcome on stage Dr. Emily Ekwe. The floor is yours, please, madam. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I extend warm greetings uh, to all of you. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank my colleague, Ms. Susan Aka, um, our very competent and dedicated um, manager of our Accra Center. It is indeed a privilege to be with you and to represent our whole team and particularly the team at the head office in Geneva, Switzerland, from where I greet you. I extend warm greetings also of our executive director, Professor Fadi Dau, and our deputy executive director, Ms. Lucy Hau Lopez. Now, for me, it is a particular uh, privilege and motivation also to participate in uh, such an important discussion uh, because my heart is with you um, as a neighbor and um, equally concerned by uh, the ecological consequences that we see not only most recently, but I think throughout the last decades, uh, we see an increase in the impact of the environmental crisis on the livelihood of our people. So I think as an ethicist, I would like to highlight uh, the importance to uh, think of the consequences for people and the environment, and also how uh, from a governmental uh, perspective and a governance perspective, these crises can be mitigated. At the same time, we see that um, it is an ethical education issue because it is about raising awareness. It is about understanding a very important nexus, namely the one between economy, wealth and ecology. Often a time we fail to see that and juxtapose uh, these components. But from an educational perspective, this is paramount because it guides us to adopt at the same time new attitudes and behaviors. So aside the immediate relief actions that one may think of and that are important for the affected populations living along uh, the Volta River in this case, one may further strengthen the reflection on a strategic approach. For example, what do we do with regard to dam safety management measures? And how can we set this on the agenda for a multi-stakeholder dialogue so that the risks for the population and their li livelihoods can be avoided or at least minimized? This, I believe, demands concerted efforts, not only on national and regional level, but also at global level. The recent discussions at the COP28 have shown that it is indeed a justice issue. Environmental justice, or as some say, eco-justice, is the definite uh, most, one of the most important uh, criteria for um, defining how we are going to be able to live together in future. 
it's a matter of peace and it's a matter of political will. So um, we see it at Globe Ethics as a call to action so that all people can benefit of uh, living conditions that allow them to prosper. And most importantly, that it doesn't stop with the current generations, but those who are not yet born. And in this responsibility, Globe Ethics calls all us represented here from different factions of the society, the members of uh, the governments of our countries, uh, but also the many non-governmental organizations such as Globe Ethics to lead towards an informed ethical discernment on how we can protect our environment and still support the legitimate interest of providing energy so that our societies and economies can prosper. I think it is a very delicate balance act. And as we have seen at uh, the beginning of this online meeting, uh, it is important to see um, different strategic objectives um, at the same time as intertwined. And at Globe Ethics, we see that it is about education. It is about setting ethical standards in education, but it is also about paying attention how those who are least responsible for the environmental damages um, can be protected. And thirdly, it is about utilizing technology and particularly the emerging technologies in such a way uh, that they serve humanity. And last not least, it is with regard to one main objective, namely the, the peace, the securement of uh, peace and inclusive peace and a responsible government that will allow us to work together and to build alliances, strong alliances of um, ethical discernment so um, that we can mitigate uh, crises such as the one that you are looking at in this online conference. I wish to um, thank once again the organizers of uh, this event, particularly my, my colleague Susan Anka, but also um, our um, director in uh, the region um, and um, all the distinguished um, speakers and attendees um, and wish you all a most fruitful um, engagement. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you, Professor Emily Ikwe, for that already insightful speech and sparking our minds to begin to think through what we'll be engaging on today. Thank you so much. I would also invite now Reverend Dr. Emmanuel Ansa, the convener of Kingdom Equip Network, to bring us brief greetings. Reverend Dr. Emmanuel Ansa, the floor is yours, please. Thank you very much, uh, Susan. And thank you, Professor Mele. It's been a wonderful time. It's been a long time also. And uh, thank you for the insightful message you're giving to us. Um, I want to welcome everybody else onto the, this discussion, this webinar. I believe that it's going to be very fruitful. We have been watching from Global Ethics, the discussion going on or the activities going on pertaining to the spillage. We've seen that a lot of the activities are centered around the economic issues, uh, the livelihoods and how people uh, uh, live, survive after the spillage. And a lot of donations, uh, CSOs, government, religious bodies, everybody has been playing their role. But we saw that the missing link so far has been the discussion on um, the, the ecological implications and how we can restore. And um, looking around, we felt that there was no other person that we could identify 
most suitable suited for this role. And I'm very sure that the, the presenter, when he gets to, on his feet and starts talking, we will all know that he's the right person to uh, address this because he has addressed such fora across the world. And I'm very confident that he's the right person to help us to understand what the implications of this uh, uh, unfortunate incident are to us, not only in Ghana, but even like Ameli said, people in Togo being affected, people in Africa, all over the world being affected because of this situation. And I'm very sure that um, as we get understanding, we will know how to better preserve our um, environment and avoid such situations. And I want to also comment uh, on the issue of the, the, the space of people who are here today. Uh, we are very, we normally have programs with higher education institutions, uh, global ethics uh, traditionally. But um, in th this year, because of the strategy that we launched, we've started engaging other institutions that are into research, that are into uh, operations, technical stuff. And in fact, last month or so, we had the one on the technology. And now on, on this page, on this, plan, this uh, webinar, I see a wide range of um, institutions, not only the research ones like CSR, the, the academic ones, the universities, but we're also seeing government institutions like uh, uh, EPA, uh, Environmental Protection Authority, and then the Meteorological Services. We are seeing a lot of agencies that are connected to the environment who are also coming on board, Water Resources Commission, and uh, also Volta River Authority, Bree Power Authority, many of authorities that are connected to um, a, a environment. And I'm so excited to see this range of uh, participants, uh, apart from the academic side, all these practical uh, op op uh, operational institutions that are connected to the subject matter for today. So I can't be, uh, just uh, wait. I can't just wait for the, the main speaker to get on and get rolling. So I wouldn't take anything from you today. I pray that we all enjoy our time today with Global Ethics, and we pray that we'll be in, uh, deepening our understanding of uh, the environment and sustainability by the close of today. And then we will be very responsible citizens wherever we are, we are listening from. I know there are friends from Kenya. We welcome you. I saw Herbert. I uh, saw so, uh, people from Pakistan, people from India, and uh, other parts of the world. And of course, Geneva uh, also on. And uh, we pray that we all get something from this day. Thank you. Thank you very well said, Reverend Dr. Manalasa. And welcome again to all of us joining us again. Um, in, we are going straight ahead with um, the agenda, our plan for us. I would like to welcome our moderator for today in the person of Madame Adwa Pencil. She has worked in the water sector for 30 years. She holds an MPhil in botany from the University of Ghana, and she's currently retired, but was the Director of Environmental Quality at the Water Resources Commission and the Acting Executive Secretary at the Commission until September this year. Shall we all please, with a virtual round of applause, join me to welcome Madame Adwa Pencil to take on the remaining sessions with our speaker, and of course, with you all who have joined us. Welcome, Madam. The floor is yours, please. Thank you. Thank you very much, Susan. And I want to extend a warm welcome to all our participants from around the world, and especially those in Ghana. And from my Commission, Water Resources Commission, um, community, um, CSIR Water Research Institute, and us this afternoon. Our speaker for today is mm. our speaker for today is a renowned retired professor at the University of Plant and Environmental Biology at the University of Ghana, Legon. He's in the person of Professor Otin. He was my lecturer at the university that was about over 30 years ago. And his interest in biodiversity spans several decades of research. Even myself, I was, I've been in the sector for 30 years. And so that means that he is over 40 years in the sector. And he has advocated in various subject areas, including local and traditional knowledge systems in Ghana. He has contributed immensely to the development of the 2016 
to 2030 Sustainable Development Goals and has published extensively on environment and biodiversity for both local and international audiences. His outstanding contribution to international conservation was publicly recognized in 2014 as a joint winner of the international prestigious Midiri Prize Biodiversity. And also in 2020, he received the John C. Phillips Memorial Medal, the ICUCN's highest conservation award. Today, we are going to listen to him as he tells us and elaborates on environmental and ecological impact of the spill at the Akosombo Dam and the Pong Dams. Let us welcome our professor, renowned professor, Professor Alfred A. Otin Yeboa with a cap clap offering. Hello, thank you very much, Ajoa. Thank you uh, very much, the Global Ethics, uh, Globe Ethics uh, West Africa Center. Thank you, colleagues who are all around, both in Ghana and outside Ghana. I consider it as a, an honor uh, to be asked to uh, provide some kind of thoughts. Uh, on the issue of the recent spill, recent dam spill on the Akosombo and Pong dams. And I am particularly happy uh, about the introductory comment that came from Professor Mele Ekwe, where uh, this concept of what we know about sustainable development, which is summed up uh, indicating our search for economic development, our search for wealth. And the third component of sustainable development, which is to be with the environment, uh, we often forget uh, to take care of this. And so, um, my presentation actually is going to situate on the aspects of the ecological lessons, which are mainly the environmental aspects, which we appear to have neglected or forgotten, if you like. And uh, partly could be responsible for uh, what is happening, even though, even though some of them are beyond our control, but uh, those that are within our own uh, perspective, uh, which we can easily handle. Um, my comments are actually going to raise some levels of our awareness, you know, to ourselves, uh, so that we will always remember that uh, when we are seeking wealth, when we are seeking happiness, uh, it should be composite and including everything that is around us. Because happiness is not only just enjoying life, but happiness is also making sure that the circumstances around you are in a very serene situation so that you as an individual uh, can have the benefit of being able to uh, live well and your colleagues will also live well and all of us will then have a situation where we live in harmony uh, with nature. I decided to uh, term the title as ecological lessons because definitely uh, there are many things which maybe when I mention them, it will come to mind, but we have taken them for granted. But one thing that is certain is that the idea of constructing a facility for hydropower generation that is across the whole world, we know that it comes with great environmental impact. That one, nobody uh, doubts it. 
it starts by changing the environment and affects land use, it affects homes, it affects cultural heartbeats, cultural situations, and also has effect on uh, global warming. Now, this kind of project, which is dam construction, plays many important roles in human activity and also in human society. For example, the large reservoir which is created from the impounding of huge volumes of water behind a dam, that large volume of water usually uh, would generate electricity. And of course, it also involves a lot of work, you know, both to international partners, uh, international work people, and local people. Uh, and it also provides an opportunity to be able to draw water uh, for various purposes, including for uh, providing potable water and irrigation for agricultural purposes. So you can see that there is a lot of benefit that come, a lot of benefits that comes from damming. But I ask myself, so one may ask, what then do you have to spill if all of these are the kind of objectives that you have for a dam? And the answer that I have found is that a spill is the release of um, excess water behind the barrier of the dam. So I keep asking, what triggers the need for a spill? And this is where I get to understand that this is when the allowable height of the water exceeds the threshold that the barrier can withstand without endangering the dam's function. So I ask another question. So how could a spill be avoided? And what consequences will result from avoiding it? And I get the answer. Yes, a spill can be avoided if careful monitoring of the rise of the water in the dam to the water flows is undertaken. However, when the rise of the water is sudden and increases rapidly, then a spill is initiated to expel the excess water. Now, when this happens, the excess water is carefully spilled in a way so as not to create unnecessary downstream flooding. Now, when we take our minds back to the start of the Akosombo Dam, that's the story of the Akosombo Dam, it's very interesting. Uh, the thought of a dam uh, came like a flash in the mind of uh, one British geologist by name Albert Kitson in 1915, a very long time ago. And of course, there were no plans at that time, but he had that vision that there was a need to have a dam. But it wasn't until after the Second World War, that is in the late 1940s, that there was the need to start thinking seriously about having a dam. Now, within this period, a South African engineer by name uh, Duncan uh, had made some private investigations and in his private writings had indicated the possibility of actually 
uh, having a down. This gentleman's name was Duncan Rose. So between 1949 and 1951, Sir William Harcrow, who is another British engineer, was tasked to develop plans for a dam. And he produ provided reports in 1951 and also 1956. Now, from these reports, the Volta River Preparatory Commission, headed by Sir Robert Jackson, who received the report, accepted the report that it was a very good one. So the construction of the dam was undertaken by the Italian engineering group called the Impregillo, which had then completed the Cariba Dam in Sabiugo in Zambia. So you could see immediately that this was something to be undertaken by somebody who has had an experience in constructing dams. Now, in April 1961, now I'm still talking about the history, the Parliament of Ghana passed the Volta River Development Act, which established the Volta River Authority as a statutory corporation with Dr. Kwame Nkrumah as first president as its first chairman. And he was supported by six board members. Briefly, the prime responsibility of the authority was to plan, execute, and, management, uh, and manage the development of the Volta River, including the construction and operation of the dam, power station, and transmission system. It was also responsible for controlling the 3,275 square mile lake behind the dam for developing the lake for fishing, transport and communications, and also for promoting the health and welfare of the people in the lake area. Now the main objectives of the dam were to store water for industrial and domestic use, to improve agriculture for providing water for irrigation, to improve inland water transport for navigation, to control and regulate the flow of the river Volta, which is characterized by seasonal fluctuations in the water level, to generate hydroelectric power, especially for melting aluminum and other industries. Now we ask the question, what precautions were expressed by the dam construction engineers? And I mentioned here, one of them was downstream flooding, which needed to be controlled. The other is displacement of communities within the gorge, which will have to be rehabilitated. rehabilitated. And the third was the destruction of the vegetation, loss of agricultural lands, and indeed destroy the, the ecology of the gorge. And I asked the question, have these been followed and what have been the results so far? I answer that these precautions were followed up to a point. The VRA, which is the Volta River Authority, concentrated its energies on power generation because the country needed power. And there's evidence that very careful analysis showing limited effort to manage the downstream circumstances or communities uh, was there. And this is a recent publication by uh, Joji Chikata, which indicated, and in fact, which reflects on what happened in September, October this year with the spill. Uh, 
And of course, the spill, which I have mentioned, resulted in infrastructural damage and loss of livelihoods. But so far, and I thank God for this, no human casualties have been reported. Now, I turn my attention to any aspects of environmental conditions, such as drought, which necessitates the uh, lowering of the water level, and then rainfall, which also necessitates the increase in the water levels. Now, there is data available, and this data indicates that the Akusumbu Reservoir experienced two drought spells during the last decades, that is between 1983, 1984, and 1997, 1998, which resulted in levels reducing below the minimum operating levels. Now, there is record also indicating how the Christian churches in Ghana fasted and prayed for rain to fill the reservoir within these periods. Now, from the Ghanaian perspective, the spiritual dimension attached to rainfall to fill the dam is very, very significant. And it tells how spiritual Ghanaians are. Now, since the construction of the dam in 1965, the potential for farming and fishing has increased tremendously within the Volta Gorge. And this has resulted in the influx of many settler families and farmers and fishers into the area. This brought so much pressure on the natural resources base of the area and they transformed, and this also helped to transform the landscape accordingly. Therefore, definitely the intellectual, or oh, sorry, the ecological integrity, the ecosystem integrity um, was under stress. And I want to make a reference to a publication by Ampofu et al. in 2015. According to them, an estimation of the trend in changes at the landscape using multi-regional, sorry, multi-temporal satellite images and processing and spatial changes, and using that to do um, processing and spatial changes um, analysis, which they undertook. And they did this to seek to understand the land use cover change in the Volta Gorge of the Volta Basin of Ghana for the period 1975 to 2017. According to Ampofo and his group, land cover changes and agricultural expansion were observed through digital processing and classification based on five multi-temporal medium resolution satellite imagery. From this accurately classified pixel information was used to determine each land cover case uh, class and the number of changed pixels uh, into other class through change were also detected. Now, with this as a background, and one looking at the trends in the total area per land cover, again, according to Ampofu, the period 1975 to 20, 2007 witnessed a steady decline of closed forests from 151,285 hectares to just a mere 28,379. That's a drastic change. 
which amounts to about 81%. During the same period, open forests and woodlands have also decreased from 170,460 hectares to 93,789. This is a very significant level of change in closed forests occurred from 1975 to 1990, when there was a decrease of about 56%, while agricultural, agriculture increased by about 183% for the same period. It's a very long story. Now, one thing that I can mention is that uh, closed forests and open forests and woodlands have both reduced tremendously in all the periods under consideration. So there was a marginal increase of about 5% for closed forests. Now with this as a background, now you can see that the decrease in closed forests and open forests and woodlands cover uh, type corresponded with the increase in the proportion of land cover for agricultural and the marginal increases for bare areas. When there is nothing on the ground, of course, that's a bare area. And that was up to 5%. Now, with this as a background information, I don't want to continue with this kind of statistics, but it is important for us now to trace our story back to the tributaries that feed the lake and their runoffs. The total annual runoff, runoff is on the average 41.6 trillion cubic, met cubic meters. This runoff is characterized by wide variability between wet and dry seasons, and also from year to year. Historically, the Black Volta contributes 23% of the total runoff, the White Volta 25%, OT 27%, and the Lower Volta the remaining 25%. Now, a table has been provided which is indicating what exactly all of these mean. And this is a reference to Anda et al. Uh, during their contribution to a project, which is the ADAPT project. Now the tributaries that feed the lake and their runoffs is important for us to know The tributaries, as I've already mentioned, are the black water, which is a vital arm of the lake, which in Burkina Faso and somewhere in Côte d'Ivoire and Mali is referred to as Mohun. White Volta called Nakamba in Burkina Faso. Red Volta arising in Burkina Faso, uh, somewhere north west of Ouagadougou, and flowing 320 kilometers southeast to join the White Volta near the Gambaga Scar, which is in Ghana. Then the Uti arises from the Penjari, in fact, in Benin and Togo, it's referred to as the Penjari River. And of course, the third, the, the, the last of the tributaries is the Afram, which rises close to about 26 kilometers northeast of Mampong and flows southeast 
into the lake. And its length is about 90 kilometers. And that uh, sorry, the Fram River has become a major or a vital arm of the lake. So having recorded all of this, I want us to just look at the lessons that we can learn from an ecological point of view in this case. First of all, there is an unpredict unpredictability of our weather pattern. And as a result of climate changes and for which we can no longer hang on to previously known weather conditions or situations that one can indicate that in about a month's time, we are going to have the rains and therefore you prepare the ground for planting and so on and so forth. Now, weather predictability is out of touch. So with this in mind, such factors as upstream, downstream sediment load is something that we need to consider. Siltation frequencies, particularly upstream, resulting in the discharge of sediments that settle at the base of the river and decrease the depth and volume of water in the dam. The presence and absence of wetlands upstream and downstream to soak excess storm or runoff water and increase or reduce the rate of water flows. We also would consider settlements and human habitations which are close to the banks of the dam. We can also see changes and removal of natural structures such as vegetation, which under normal circumstances can be considered to check erosion and control floods. So from my con concentration on these lessons, I am limiting this presentation from just three points, three areas. Sedimentation of the lake, prevention of erosion and maintenance of wetlands within the basins and reef vegetation to ensure that land surface are covered. We have been made aware that rivers contain sediments and can be considered as lotic, now, when a river is stilled behind a dam, it becomes lentic and does not flow. So the sediments that it contains sink gradually to the bottom. And of course, the proportion of a river's total sediment load captured by a dam which is known as its trap efficiency, approaches 100% for many projects, especially those with large reservoirs like our Volta Dam. Now, as the sediments accumulate, and so is the amount of water that the dam is supposed to hold decreases. There are many things that I can talk about on wetlands, because the wetlands in many parlances would say wastelands, because they see wetlands as useless. 
But we are saying here that wetlands, when they are present, act as sponge to silk excess water, hold on to this excess water, and gradually release the water for any other function that may be needed later. There are other things that I have mentioned, but let me just go straight to the recommendations so that at least it will give listeners some point to reflect on what we can do. I'm considering the following actions as needed in order to counter the major ecological issues that are prevailing in the gorge. First one is sedimentation. Of course, we need to monitor sedimentation. That also will involve constantly checking the height of water, dredging the bottom of the lake as and when needed, especially on suspicion of sedimentation buildup. We need to study and identify the sedimentation load of the water from the tributaries along its flow into the lake. Dredging may be needed here so that the dam will, read, will be rid of all of these that will decrease the volume of water when it is really needed. Vegetation cover, I'm indicating here, we need to sensitize traditional land owners and authorities in the gorge to maintain their forest areas, including their traditional groves and hunting grounds. I must mention here the Akwamu traditional leadership. They are doing very good work. And I want to also ask other traditional leaders in the gorge area to be encouraged and support in maintaining their cultural landscapes by making sure that these are protected. Then for wetlands, as I've already indicated, wetland areas should be protected and not turned into other land use. There must be a policy to increase wetland spaces and map out the areas that are prone to flooding and alert the district municipal and assemblies in those locations to act accordingly. Fishery, the policy of fishery and related laws on fishery must be enforced. Settlements and habitation, no new settlements should be allowed. Expansion of existing settlements should be discouraged and if possible, economic activities should be controlled. For agriculture, what I'm saying is that we need to educate the farmers to desist from farming 50 meters or less from the banks of the dam. And we need to also encourage them to plant cover crops to reduce erosion from runoffs. I want to recall the precautions that I mentioned earlier. We need to go back to the drawing board, to study the precautions that were suggested at the time of the dam construction and which over the years we have experienced. I'm referring to the settlements and urbanization. We need to be sure that these are carefully controlled so that when there should be a, a, a spill, which I hope and I believe and I trust God will not happen again, we won't have any devastation as we have experienced not long ago. I also make reference to invasive species. We need by all means to prevent and or control as much as possible the establishment of invasive species especially on the water bodies. The tributaries must be constantly examined to determine any trace of these invasives. And here I'm directing my attention to the Afram wing, because that area has 
suddenly become an area which is attracting many, many urban settlements. Donko Chrome used to be a village. Now Donko Chrome has become a, a, an urban center, attracting many people. And lots of the lands that were supposed to have been covered in vegetation have all been removed, exposing the soils uh, and, of course, erosion and erodivity are uh, taking place. Now, the last point that I'm referring to is plastic pollution. I am suggesting that we should prevent as much as possible, control and remove the, all plastics of any kind from our water bodies. Because plastics, the contribution that they make is when we use them to either carry water or whatever that we want to use them uh, in our homes. But on water, they are not useful. They are not useful in the sense that they do not biodegrade and because they do not biodegrade, those parts that break off, they become like uh, pellets, which are swallowed by fish, which eventually, when we catch them, the chemical content in those plastics get back into our own food chain. So as much as possible, we should remove the plastics from the lake. So, Mama Moderator, I think I will pause for the moment. And uh, if there are any situations where I may have to come back, yeah. I will willingly come back. But thank you very much for the opportunity that you are giving to me. Thank you. Thank you very much, Prof. We are very happy to have heard you this afternoon concerning the Volta Basin and especially the statistics that you gave were very interesting. Okay, so at this point, we would want to engage all the participants who would like to ask questions. You may raise your hand and then I would call you. However, we noticed that about 20 persons are appearing as Antonitia. Kindly click on your name where it shows me and then rename yourself. And for those of you who are asking for the presentation, please add your email also to your name. Thank you very much or your email in the chat. So we would now take questions and comments and clarifications from all participants. So raise your hand and I will call you. Hello. Okay, so Mr. Richard Eshen, Hello? your hand is up, you may speak. Yes, you may speak, I'm muted. Okay. Hello, good afternoon. Thank you so much for the insightful presentation. I'm very much grateful. Uh, I would want to say this. Gone were those days when uh, every community or every, uh, let's say, 100 meters, there is a government pipe bond stated. Uh, how late did... Uh, I hear of uh, water spillage from all the water uh, bodies that we have in Ghana. But our fleet, it looks to see if uh, waterworks have uh, been regulating amount of water that need to be used by the, the individual. Meaning if the amount of water is not taken out from their tank. Uh, we, uh, 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 they are not ready to fill in, uh, what is it, fill in. That is my personal, uh, what is it, observation. So uh, if, so if uh, water is made available, a cons consumption of it is made available to a lot of people, communities, the cycling of water into their 
natural uh, 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 habitat would, would, would not be spillage, would not destroy the ecology at all. So I think uh, uh, this must also be looked at. I don't know whether you understand what I am trying to mean. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Richard Ishan. Um, Prof, would you like to intervene? Oh, yes. Um, I think um, the answer is uh, the concept of irrigation. We have irrigation that goes into the agricultural areas to water our plants. So that part of the arrangement is there. Nobody has to that. The irrigation processes, in fact, many of the um, dugouts, if you like, in the northern part of, country, of the country, where um, irrigation channels have been made. It's all just to collect water so that the water will be available during the dry spell, so there will be food uh, production. You know. So that one, there's no problem. The spill we are referring to is one where you have a dam which is generating electricity. Of course, um, uh, if I have to look at the Wager Dam, for example, Wager Dam, uh, which provides water, Wager Dam uh, at some time, sometimes are spilled because, again, there's so much water behind the, the dam, the barrier. And the only way to save the dam is to spill the excess water, which is not at that time. So that's what I can say. Okay, thank you very much, Paul. I think he also touched on Ghana Water Limited rationing water and also recycling of water. So um, that we, even though we have a lot of water in Ghana, um, we have what we call economic water shortage. And that is um, defined as um, having enough investment to bring water to your doorstep 24 seven. And we lack that capacity as at now. So I know that um, with time, we will be able to um, get there. I think um, we have quite a number of hands up Please, the um, hand with Antonitia. Please rename yourself. Okay, so that hand has really gone down. Um, we have um, Ben Kwaku. Please unmute and speak. Thank you very much, uh, moderator, and also Prof. That's been a wonderful uh, presentation, which is very <laughs> Informative. Just two questions briefly on, first of all, on this presentation. I would like to know if there has been any engagement in terms of proper system check in, where expertise are given a bit more uh, know-how to manage control systems in, in the case where there is likelihood of flooding or potential breaching of the of the river river bank and how they respond to that. And secondly, given that local communities have to be engaged positively in terms of proper land use measures, such as cultivation and of course land use that help to soak up water within the, the river basins. I'm just wondering what has been the engagement with local communities to, you know, to achieve that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your question. Yes, please. Um, yes, yes please. Um, yes, the, I have not had a direct engagement with uh, experts uh, on this, but listening to comments that have come from the uh, VRA and other uh, water experts. I, th I think that what I have mentioned um, is part of the answers that they themselves have given to the general public. So I was just rehashing uh, what is already uh, in the public domain. Now, with the, uh, the local 
uh, people, the communities, uh, as part of the agricultural um, strategy to ensure that there is that minimal amount of water available for crops. They are always advised to have cover crops. Cover crops is, uh, apart from serving the, the, the role of binding the soil, so it, um, it, it controls erosion and making, in some parts, the, uh, the soils compact. It also provides water, which is available to the crops that we have planted. So that one, it's, it's one of those things which the extension officers and other agricultural specialists always tell the local community, the local farmers. So again, it's another well-known uh, knowledge. But of course, you see, uh, who is there to ensure that uh, what you have taught is implemented? So there must be a constant reminder all the time. And that's the reason why I think group ethics uh, idea of bringing up these things would be for us to be aware that not everybody is conforming to what the scientists have been saying. Some of them are even traditional knowledge systems which they have, which they have been using all along. Thank you very much, Prof. I also want to add that um, there's, a, there's a dam safety regulation of 2016 LI 2236, um, which is being administered by the Water Resources Commission. And so um, the VRA was also guided by that um, regulation because they have a, license, um, a permit and a license for the Akosombo Dam and the Pond Dams. Okay, thank you. I'd like to listen to um, Anthony Tia. Oh no, the person has been renamed himself. And so we have um, Lopamadura Gosh. Please unmute and uh, speak. Uh, hello everyone. This is Lopamudra Ghosh from India. And um, I would like to thank the speakers and of the and globe ethics for bringing out such an important topic for discussion uh, my question is since much of this discussion has been attributed to ethics uh, is it not this that human beings uh, sensory gratification and capitalistic needs are the only reasons behind dam spills and injustices that are being done against the environment. So if anyone uh, would, uh, would like to know the, the, the solution to all of it, it's just, uh, it, it is just understanding what spirituality actually is, and it is just our movement towards, uh, towards doing away with any kind of sensory gratification and moving and actually connecting uh, one another towards and, and enriching each other's journey towards transcendence. So should that not be the solution for all of these issues as grave as environmental injustice? Oh, please, you can take the floor and respond. <laughs> I, I cannot agree more, than, more with you. Um, yes, there is always a sensory gratification, which uh, for people, uh, that is a way of indicating their power or that's a way of indicating their joy. But uh, when, when we go back to understanding the real concept of sustainable development. I think that that concept you know, encompasses almost everything to do with whatever we have as human beings and what we do to ensure that there is life available for everybody. Or there is, if you like, happiness available for everybody. But when you have the situation tilting towards um, uh, I don't, <laughs> where 
it's only one groups of people, a few groups of people who are maximizing the profit and it's not uh, going down to everybody. That is where the ethics come in. But otherwise, otherwise, uh, the way we have been created by God, there's always the desire to have something which, which pleases us. There's always that desire. But then there must be a limit to what you desire and what other people also want. So this becomes a moral issue which hovers on the area of ethics and human behavior. So at some stages, you may need some reflections asking yourself whether um, am I the only one who should benefit from this? Or there are other people who are around who also uh, have to have uh, the opportunity to also get a benefit. All of these are issues which come up when we begin to ask one another, especially where people ask such questions as, what is it, what is in it for me? The individualistic component there. And that is what, again, the gratification that uh, you have referred to in forms of the perception that people have. That's where we have the problem. But otherwise, as far as I am concerned, I think the issue of transcendency is a very important point which we need to consider. And it's all encompassing, you know, sustainable development. If you look at it, we are talking of economic, social, and the environment. The three must be seen to be working together to bring the whole unit of human endurance, human existence, and if you like, humans in harmony with the nature in which they live. Of course, the nature in which they live also include other human beings together with the inanimate things that are around. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Prof. Um, Reverend Dr. Ebenezer Yaobla, so please unmute and ask your question or make your comments. Hello? Yes, we can hear you. You may go ahead. Uh -huh. Thank you, Prof. Thank you. Um, I just want to ask one or two questions. The first one, picking it from where the last speaker just ended or asked about the ethical issues concerning dams pillage. From what you said all through, it seems to me from the very beginning of thinking nationally about a dam like the Akosombo and the Pong situations, there was not a national ethical, excuse me, say reasoning around the effects on those at the downstream of the dam. When I heard of this program, the spillage of the Pong and Akosombo dams, I got interested to participate because I'm speaking to you right now from Sokwe, near Sugakopa, yeah. near Mepe, yeah. where you must have heard the greater part of the effect of the spillage has occurred. Yeah. But what I have heard so far showed me that from the very beginning in the 1940s through to the 50s and others when this dam finally got constructed in 63, there was no ethical thought of what happened to those on the uh, downside of the dam, even to date. And hence the, ty the type of like a classical attitude towards the spillage effect on those of us downstream. 
because all that I've heard you said now is about the Volta Gorge, the Volta Gorge. Every plan, what will happen to the dam is about the Volta Gorge. Nothing about the downstream. And we are not in Volta Gorge. And we have suffered so much so far from the very beginning of the construction in 63. I was young. I know what we went through. 60 years on, 2023, we have suffered the same thing now. Everywhere I listen to people, there isn't any national ethical view of what would have happened to those of us downstream here since then, even till now. And so it doesn't surprise me that even in this talk, excuse me to say, all the recommendation doesn't seem to say anything about downstream. It's all about the Volta Gorge. Prof, is it the case that there wasn't a national ethical IQ concerning the people downstream before the dam was constructed? And even now that it is have a spillage, there is no national ethical thought about those people downstream here who are the ones suffering the most. Uh, can, Thank you very I, much. Yeah, can I okay. respond to uh, Reverend Doctor? Yes. Yeah, yes. Uh, yes, please. Yeah, Papa, I have actually uh, had a lot of discussion with Joji, Joji Chikata. She, she's a, a colleague. And her book, um, Living in the Shadows of the. Yeah, I, I have read carefully everything that has happened. And so, poor. Uh, Shogakope and all those towns, Mepe and all those towns that are downstream. Yes, I have lots and lots of sympathies. But my focus, as I indicated, was to prevent a spell. That is why I didn't make any mention. But at a particular point, I indicated the need to have more wetland areas everywhere, particularly in the downstream. I think I mentioned that. And so if I didn't speak uh, directly on the ecological lessons downstream, it is because my whole thought was, what do we do in order to prevent a spillage? It's not what happens after the spillage. But one thing that I can tell you, I mentioned to you the proportions that were given by the consultants who developed the scheme to develop uh, the dam. They, they mentioned all of these as things that are likely to happen. They mentioned them. So it is probably our oversight, you know, which wasn't well, good enough you know, to, to, to pick on this. And I know my colleagues in the Volta Basin uh, uh, project have been looking at all of these and providing uh, some useful recommendations on what to do with the people downstream. So, Reverend, if I if you didn't hear me talk about the lower or the downstream area, it's because the topic that I selected was how do we, from an ecological point of view, the lessons that we are learning or the lessons that are coming in, prevent a spill. And to prevent a spill, is to make sure that there's a lot of volume for the dam to carry water. See, if all these primary precautions and uh, sorry, primary issues of ecology are not taken into consideration, one day eh, the whole dam will be silted and the amount or the volume of water that we are supposed to have will, will, will completely collapse. That, that is where my uh, 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 thoughts are. But definitely, I have lots and lots of sympathy because of my relationship with Professor Joji. Because I have read a book, and um, I have also been seeing uh, excerpts from other writers in the Ghanaian dailies. I've also seen um, graphics uh, of what is happening. It, 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 it's very sad. I have relatives who live at Bume in the Volta region, just before Shogakope, who are also, I mean, because they are relatives, eh, the concern has always been with me. So, Reverend, hmm. forgive me, please, if I didn't mention. 
the lower directly. And there we <laughs> Thank you, Prof. But just, just as a concern I'm sharing, because right now, Prof, to me, to interest you, I have started a 60, to, to follow the 60 years of the dam and its effect on the downstream people here as part of my research work with Leeds University in UK. Okay. I just to look at the religious and ethical concerns and yeah. how we could tap on that even though we are downstream, to still maintain the ecosystem, ecosystem that we had before uh, the dam, and looking for preliminary information, data about how the ecosystems were before the dam, and how that has changed over the years, and what does our religiosity and morality do to it, I find it difficult to get data before the construction, not even now. I can get it for the gorge. Even when I was looking at biodiversity, I saw Professor Ayensu's work. It is not saying anything about the downstream. All the information are about the gorge. That is what is making me ask these questions. So okay. if we are having any recommendation even now, yeah. may we not think of the downstream also and not maintain attitude only towards the gorge. It's okay. making it difficult for us even got academic data to do good research to see how our morality and our religiosity could be used to maintain the ecosystem over here down the stream. Because whatever be the case, the dam has devastated our ecology over here. Yeah. And I'm doing my best to use, you know, to research into and see how we can encourage the traditional religious people, the Christians and the Muslims around here, how do we put our religiosity and ethics together to maintain the little that we have for our children tomorrow? But the national level doesn't seem to have any idea about that or any interest in that. Bro, that is where my concern is. All the yes. documents are passed so far. No one has tried to do any information like that. It's all about the upstream. Okay. I think ethically it's unfair. Thank you. Papa, this is one reason why I think this particular exposition is coming on. Because it's not only you who are listening. There are other organizations, particularly VRA, the University of Ghana, which has a special project looking at this. They are all listening. So, and of course, as a result of the spill, so much has been said about the spill that has damaged livelihoods. Uh, there are a lot that are also known, which Water Research Institute of yes. can provide for you. BBRP, that's the University of Ghana uh, uh, Basin uh, uh, Project. Um, there are quite a number. I mean, if you begin to start ask, if you uh, if you start asking, you will get uh, some religious components behind this. See, the collapse of the clam industry, which was the livelihood of the people downstream, we, we are aware of it. Even the, um, uh, you, you know, so many things have happened as a result of uh, non-flow of the alluvial, which, uh, which used to flow downstream, which was also part of the uh, food in the food chain for and the other aquatic organisms and so on. all of these. And then the, um, um, the, the effect even on the, on the estuary, uh, Ada estuary and also Keta, uh, all of these are issues which are national issues which we are looking at. So thank you, but I, I know uh, there are other people who are listening who will also make an effort to create Thank you very much. Okay, so what we'll do next is we would ask Garden City University College to ask their question or make their comments, after which um, Mary Boydou will also ask their comments, hey, ask their questions and make their comments. Please make them very brief. So Garden City University College, unmute and then make your intervention. Yeah. Thank you very much, Prof. 
for your presentation. There's a lesson we all need to learn from this. Um, the ecological, social, and uh, whatever dimensions that have been involved in this. We also could add health issues. Now, the health issues also border on the social. Now, the issue is this. We as a country, what do we learn from our experiences in the past? We have experienced Bagrat Dam water spillage or dam spillage in the northern parts of our country, Ghana. Now, we perhaps are facing this spill of excess water for the first time to this extent, the first time. And uh, with the current trend of global warming that we are experiencing, I, I can see that we may be having more rains in coming years if global warming continues like this. The geographers and all those who can tell us how that could happen. Evaporation of water into the atmosphere and condensation and more rains can come. Now, the issue is this. Um, what do we do to prevent such spillage of that much of water? People are in places where they don't have water to drink. We're talking about agricultural irrigation. Uh, a child, when he saw this, was commenting and asking, now, uh, Daddy, is there any way that all this water being thrown away could be diverted and sent to people who don't have uh, clean water to drink? I smiled a bit. I said, well, my son, you are saying something very important. But the issue is this. We may not be able to stop the rain from coming, but with this experience, I want to suggest that we should learn something from what you have presented. And that lesson is that, can we prevent such spillage of water? If we cannot stop the rains from coming down as they did this year, can we somehow stop or prevent this spillage of water? And how do we do it? Maybe the governments, our governments should be looking at this because if we had a vision at the time that dam was being built, that this thing could happen. And if, if we learn from the Bagrat Dam experience, we should be in a position to uh, see, foresee that we could have this problem of excess water coming behind the dam. Of course, if the dam excess water is not spilled, uh, the fear is that maybe if the dam eventually, apart from saltation, uh, could blow up. And you can imagine what will happen to those who are downstream of the, uh, uh, the, the dam. And so I think one lesson we should learn, maybe if there's a way we can make any uh, suggestion proposal to our government, we should make it now. What we should do to prevent such spillage in the future. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, sir. Well, we would ask uh, Mary Buedu to make an intervention very brief. The rest of us kindly write your intervention, your comments and your questions in the chat box. Thank you. Thank you very much, Madam Facilitator. And thank you, Prof, for your insightful presentation. I have two questions. And the first one is one of the recommendations we are making probably to avoid what we have just seen is dredging of the dam to ensure that it can contain more water and then we don't have to like spill it. So I'm just wondering, is the government being engaged about this? And if so, are there plans for a sustainable dredging of the dam every now and then so it can contain more water and not the water running over and causing so much harm. That's the first one I want to find out what is being done in terms of engagement with the government for dredging sustainably of the dam. The other one is also the population. You mentioned that the, the area at the time used to be village, some part of it, but now it's becoming a town with more people living there. Are there engagement with them 
to sort of control their activities. We all know that when you say people shouldn't build in particular places, many times they just become adamant. So what are we doing to engage the communities to sort of slow the activities that are having negative impact on the dam? Thank you very much. Okay. Madam Moderator, can I take... Uh, uh, yes, please, Pro, please, you can take... Let, let me start, start from Professor Mary Wardu's uh, uh, questions. The, the two questions asked are uh, very, very interesting. Um, I wish VRA management is around, and if uh, what I have suggested, particularly with dredging, they have discussed the plans with government because they are in charge. In fact, to all intents and purposes, the whole area of the gorge is under the control of VRA. So that suggestion was actually addressed to VRA, who should now approach government to make the necessary Oh, please, VRA is on. Okay, if they are on, then of course, uh, I will wish that they can make a comment on this because I am an individual, a concerned individual. My interest has been that we should protect our biological resources, which include the water. What you know, water is uh, an ecosystem. And, and so that's where my interest, I don't have any control over things of this kind. The other is also with the population, which I believe the MMDAs are supposed to be those that should monitor what is happening within their own areas. And the comment from Garden City, yes, it's a very good comment. The health risks and other related matters are issues that are already known. So those ones will be handled. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Prof. Um, VRA, um, Chairman of the Lower Volta Basin Board, Mr. Abdul Wahab, if you would like to make some brief comments concerning um, this afternoon's discourse, and also um, Mr. Paddy. Mr. Paddy, if you are also there, if you would also want to make some comments, Kindly raise your hands and then you can do so. Okay, uh, good, good afternoon uh, and thank you, Madam. Um, this is Abu Wahab, uh, I think the, the presentation is insightful. Our objective was to listen in and hear the different perspectives that people bring to bear as far as the management or the, the topic under discussion is concerned. So for now, I'll just say that it's an interesting discussion. And we can take the different views and see how we can also use it in the work that we do. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, um, Chairman of the Lower Volta Basin Board and also um, staff of the VRA. We would also want to call upon um, Dr. Peter Derry, if he's available to make some brief comments. Dr. Peter Derry from Ministry of Environment. Okay, I think he's, 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 he's gone off. And so we would want to continue with our program. So we would also want to, um, before we finally leave and make our final comments, we would like to show a five minutes presentation or video 
of global ethics resources for ethical foundations and global partnerships. So please stay online. We'll continue after the video.
Welcome. Welcome back. Thank you very much for the short um, uh, video on global ethics. Global ethics. Okay, so. And so there are some questions in the chat I would like to read. And um, it, it talks about what government is doing. So the question from David says, what regulations and standards are in place to govern dam construction, operation and maintenance and how compliance and how is compliance ensured? Okay, so that is one question. And then the other question, talks about what steps, what proactive steps is the government taking to prevent dam spills and ensure the safety of existing dams in the long um, run. So what I would like to say concerning these things is that there's the dam safety regulations of 2016, which ensures the safety of dams in the country. And then as for spillage of dams um, from time to time, and to, due to the um, 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 climate change, there would be some flooding events that will let the dams um, spill. However, the mitigation measures that government would put in place is what um, should be considered. And um, concerning the flooding issues, government I know is um, doing quite a lot uh, especially in the white water to prevent flooding um, when the boundary dam is filled and when we have excessive um, rain. And so um, these are the things that government is um, currently you know, doing. So um, Prof, if you would like to make some extra comments, then we would take that. Thank you very much. Yes, um, thank you, uh, Madam Moderator. Uh, I like the concept of the standardization, the standard that has been set uh, for the regulation of dam construction operations and so on and so forth. In every civilized society, you need to have this as a background information and also something to direct and uh, the future of an endeavor like a dam construction. And I'm happy that you have referred to uh, some regulatory processes that are already in place. One problem that we have in our country is this, that yes, the regulations are there, yes, the laws are there, but we flout them. The question is, who is it that will go back round to, to check that the responsibilities that have been assigned to specific institutions are actually being undertaken. This is our biggest problem in our country. The kind of discipline that we are supposed to have in terms of management, in terms of responsibility, in terms of oversight, I mean, uh, coverage of almost everything that is Ghanaian appears to be lacking, you know, and that is where I, I get very sad, you know, when people have been given responsibilities and they take the responsibilities as uh, an arm of power which they can use. But they forget that that responsibility is asking you to ensure that those elements that brought into being the organization in which you are heading are the ones that you have been taking to check every day. Is it working? If it's not working, go back to whoever framed that organization, once you have identified where the, hit, uh, the, the, the difficulties are, or problems are, I think nothing stops you because at the end of the day, we will ask you, Ghanaians will ask you, what have you done? So if at that time that you are going to give reasons why you have not been able to do this and to do that, of course, one sees that you are irresponsible. But I know that every Ghanaian is a responsible human being. Every Ghanaian is a responsible human being. And what I want to plead is among us who are assembled here, there are many of us who have been entrusted with responsibilities and those responsibilities be host on us to see your country as first, not yourself. Let us run away from 
uh, this selfish uh, kind of thing. What is it in it for me? Rather, what is in it for Ghana? I think when our attitude changes, when our attitude changes, and we become dis we become disciplined uh, into uh, the engagement which we have been put in, I believe that the question about uh, dam constructions and what is supposed to be happening, uh, the questions about and managing dam uh, spills and so on and so forth. I, th I have always said uh, that these things, when we have the right attitude towards our country, all these things will change. So my last plea, my last plea is this, that let us allow discipline to come back into our hearts. Because any nation that strives high, that goes far. They go far because they are disciplined. I don't want to go into the area which is not part of our discussion now, but there's no discipline in our country so long as the use of our water bodies are concerned. Look at this, this spoilage, uh, the, uh, the kind of thing. I don't want to go there, but you see, this is another point that I'm making a reference to. We are watching and people are polluting the water that gives us life. And it looks like our hands are tied to our backs. We are not able to do anything. What are the opinion leaders? What are the government officials? Who are, where are they? So let us allow discipline to enter into our hearts and let us be um, mature enough to know that whatever we do, we are doing it for Ghana and also for the generation that is to come. After we have gone, for how long do we stay here? The, the average age that we get to here is about 60. Now it's moved to about 70. But 70 years, is no, it's, it's not a long time. Within a very short time, all of us will go and a new set of people will come. If we don't set the proper attitude to work, then of course, those who will come after us, <laughs> I don't know. I, I, I'm not a, I'm not a prophet, but I cannot. I don't want to say anything. <laughs> but let us pray. I think part of it is also when our hearts are clean and pure, and we are looking at good things that will come to our country, not good things that will come to us as individuals. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Prof, for your final intervention would like to call on Director Dr. John Lambon to make a short intervention or presentation from CSIR. Good afternoon, Madam Chair. Hello. 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 Yeah. Good afternoon. Hello. Good afternoon, Zon. Yeah. Hello, Prof. we can hear you. Yeah, Prof. Good afternoon, sir. Yeah, good afternoon. Yeah, I actually don't have much to say after my former director general has done a well detailed presentation. The little I want to say is that um, the recommendations that he has given, if Globe Ethics will be able to get the duty bearers concerned to be able to look at those recommendations that Prof has given. For instance, if you look at the sedimentation, to avoid sedimentation at the Volta Lake, which, is fall, which falls within the domain of the VRA, if they are listening or if they will get access to this recommendation, I think they will be able to work in future to avoid um, so much water collection that would necessitate this kind of spillage. Then you look at the vegetation cover removal and then the agriculture, which takes place mostly in the Volta Basin. These are also areas that um, local government and the traditional leaders and the re relevant ministries would be able to also take up that recommendation. For instance, the farmers who may be farming within these areas, if the ministry is able to 
give them good agricultural extension advice. They will be able to keep to the, the laws that are saying that you shouldn't farm uh, less than 15 meters to the, to, to, to the bank of the river and so on. Then Prof also talked about the settlement and the re, uh, habitation along the either the catchment area or even the lower uh, basin, sorry, the lower downstream of the Volta. These are also areas that the district assemblies within these areas can also take up this responsibility by educating the people around so that um, they'll be able to, to um, not, not, <laughs> not, not go to the riverside to, to expand building and then when there's small uh, water, then their houses are flooded. Then uh, you look at uh, what the Reverend also talked, the concerns about the lower, um, lower Volta residents. I think that if VRA and the GMET were able to be collaborating so much, such that GMET is able to predict that this year there will be so much rain, and then VRA begins to spill the water gradually, then it will be better than maybe not collaborating and you wait. And when the water is so much, like it happened this year, where hundreds of thousands of cubic meter is released per second. And definitely, it will definitely affect uh, the communities. So I think uh, Prof's uh, recommendation is so key that duty bearers will have to take note of these things. And then probably if we implement, we'll avoid future occurrences. Whether we like it or not, like the Garden City man is saying, with the climate change, more rains are likely to come. We cannot tell. And who knows whether what will happen tomorrow or tomorrow next may even be more than uh, what happened this year. So GMET and VRA, for me, I think they need to collaborate. And lastly, I want to also suggest that VRA and the district assemblies would also form something like um, um, either upstream or downstream working groups that those people uh, will have the uh, representation from the assemblies, the traditional leaders, and the technical people from VRA and maybe EPA, so that they will be able to, to monitor what might happen and advise the people accordingly, so that um, in future we may not have what uh, befell on us a few months ago. Thank you very much. Hello. Thank you very much. Um, yes, we, we heard you, please. Yeah. So Thank I you very I'll much, Dr. It. John Lambon from the CSIR. Yeah. All your recommendations have been taken note of. Thankfully, these actors are also here with us and they are listening in on your recommendations. And we believe that we'll be taking action on them as it augurs for all of us who are stakeholders, our concerns. We have been discussing and considering the ecological and in tandem, the climatic and environmental issues around the dam spills, and also how that can lead to prevention of issues downstream. We are looking at all these considerations because as has been variously said, we want to have sustainable ecosystems because we are dependent on them whether we like it or not. I want to quickly acknowledge all who have joined us and um, honor the invitations, all the discussions, all the submissions that have come in these discussions. From our very eminent speaker, Professor Alfred Otinyebua, we are very grateful for your time and for the depth of the information that you brought to us and brought to the, the discussions also. I want to also thank our moderator and the person of Madame Adra Pencil. And my thanks also goes to Professor Mele Ekwe. She has been with us throughout, even though today she's out of office, but she felt this was an important discussion. She had to be a part of. And also our thanks goes to the contact for Global Ethics in Ghana, Reverend Dr. Emmanuel Ansa, who has also been a key facilitator in all the processes that we have come to see here today. I'm giving my thanks and appreciation on behalf of the center to all of you who have stayed with us over these two hours, 
we are rounding up because we are running out of time. We have had engaging discussions here today. We have picked some lessons, and I know we also have further recommendations. Um, we'll be sharing a feedback form whilst we share with you the link to these discussions, to this recording. And we ask, we crave your indulgence, pardon me, to fill in further information, what your comments are, what your suggestions are, what are your proposals, and how you also, as a key actor, are willing to collaborate so that we can sustain these ecosystems that we have been discussing today. So my thanks again goes to everyone, the CSOs, the NGOs, the government agencies, authorities from the communities, and members of the higher education institution community, Global Six Associates joining us from across the world, the media, and all of you who are our partners and associates along the way. Before we leave, I'll just take a quick comment from the national contact in Ghana, Reverend Dr. Emmanuel Ansa, and then we'll be out of here. Thank you so much for your attention. And by the way, before I go, you can access the chat box. We have sent several links to most of our resources, our online library, our publishing house, our academy. We run an ethics academy where we run courses on ethical considerations around digital and emerging technologies, higher education institutions, sustainable environment, and also responsible governance. There are several materials there. Please assess them all in the chat. Thank you. And I welcome Reverend Dr. Emmanuel Ansa to bring the final closing remarks. Thank you. Thank you very much, Susan. And um, I think it's all thanks, thanks, thanks to everybody from the main speaker, Professor Alfred Otiniabua. And for, I'm not disappointed, I'm very, very excited and fulfilled that he was the right kind of person to talk about this matter. And I'm happy that he's done justice to the subject. And I'm also happy that we were able to reach out to all who really needed to be around the table. VRA, Dam Project, all the others, administrators, uh, local government people, uh, educationists, uh, uh, researchers, everybody around the table um, has something to offer. And I, I was enth enthused also and educated about the, the morality, the religiosity um, of saving the environment. I think I'm going to take that as a clergyman. I'm going to find out a lot more. And I thank all those who contributed and brought new understanding to this subject of uh, ecosystems relating to the water um, uh, river, water lake and the spill that has gone on. I've never had some things that I've, this, I'm hearing for the first time um, in this discussion. We've heard about the, uh, the humanitarian interventions, we've heard about the economic interventions, the agriculture, the political interventions and all, but I can't uh, thank God enough for the new understanding I'm getting and the challenge we have. I believe that with, around this table, if we collaborate more, this will not be just a talk shop. We are certainly going to move forward. And fortunately, the powers that be, EPA, and everybody have been around this table, Ministry of Environment, all those who really have something to do with this and uh, solving this and avoiding this future occurrence have been here. Uh, Ghana Metro uh, Meteorological uh, Authority, everybody has been here. So I know that they are, we are all taking home something and we'll follow up. Global Ethics Trust Us will come to you, your various offices, and make sure that the follow-up that has to be done will just certainly be done. I want to thank Susan and the technical team behind it, uh, this, this presentation and this promo, uh, program today. And I pray that when we call again, we will all come around again. And especially our foreign guests, our people from Scotland, uh, Mr. Kwaku and others, those from India, those from Kenya, those from Geneva, we only thank you so much. You are not in Ghana, you may not know the water lake, but you made time to spend two hours with us. Thank you so much for being part of us. And uh, we hope that we'll continue with you um, in, in the, into the future. Thank you. Have a blessed afternoon. Thank you very much. And season's greetings. Happy New Year in advance. Thank you. <laughs> the same Thank to you. you. <laughs> Thank you, Prof. Thank you. Thank you.